Hello. I've often seen people come on stage on that awkward silence of setting everything. I was like, okay, entertain us. Um, well, hello, everyone. If we have not met, um, my name, this is quite tall, actually. <gasps> so, are you good? Hello. <laughs> um, if we have not met, my name is Digelo. Um, I've been going to city for many, many years, and I have the incredible privilege of being one of the worship leaders here at church. I am a singer, I'm a songwriter, I'm an actress, I, I do, I'm an agile product owner, I work in IT, amongst other things, um, and I'm a lover of Jesus, I love traveling, and I have three nieces, I often fear people to introduce themselves that way, so I thought I'd also have a bio, um, but in preparation for this, um, this sort of, I guess you would call it a testimony slash story, um, I kind of went into like overthinking, you know, because every good testimony has a that beginning story, you know, that, that the treacherous journey, and then that emotional part that just grips you, and then the then God moment, just to help you contextualize everything, you know? And then like everything in my life, God was just like, just speak. Now, disclaimer, God speaks to me in sarcasm. That's how we speak. Um, but I still love God and I still respect Him, so please don't, don't think that I, I delilah God here, you know? If you don't know what delilah means, ask someone around you. Um, so... In the beginning of this year, I started off this year with a prayer and fast. Um, it's something that I've been doing for three years now. I was inspired to do it by, um, I don't know if you know, Maita and Regan Skyle. They're amazing. Um, and the aim was basically to get my word for the year, the thing that I was going to go and, you know, um, the journey that God was going to take me on. The first year that I did it, I got accelerated. And that was the year that God was going to just fast track every single thing that I've prayed for. And it was going to be as if I had never waited the second year was fulfillment, and it was all about how I was going to just go deeper with him, that he was going to be my reward ultimately, right? And then, so this year came, same thing. I now go into the, to the year. Um, at one point, the word anchor sort of drops in my head. And I was like, that makes sense, right? We're going to go deeper with God. We're going to be anchored in the Word of God. And so I do everything. I start gathering the sermons. I start gathering the, the devotionals because we were going to go deeper with God. And um, but something just didn't feel quite right with that word. And what I mean about it is that, I mean, it made sense. I leaned into it, you know, like who doesn't want to go deeper with God? I mean, I even got a little app that allows you to plug in a word and then it just sort of generates it in a nice little background. I don't know if you've got it. Can you, give, you got it on the, on the screen there? That was my word. I was going to be anchored. I had it for my phone. I had it for my screensaver and everything. But then God said to me, um, that's not it. He whispered the word obedience. My heart, guys, you say nice. My heart stopped. My heart stopped and I was a little bit scared. I was like, nope, that's not it. Mm -mm, that's not it. And it scared me a little bit. And what I mean by that is that I realized that the litmus test of whether or not I was honoring this word was not going to be dependent on me. It was going to be dependent on him to really, truly submit to God. He's leading, he's yeses, he's no, he's not now. He would get to be the one that holds me accountable for it. You see, the word anchor for me, it would have been easy to sort of judge it with my own human strength, you know. I spend an hour in the word. I worshiped extra hard. I gave more money than usual. I prayed for that friend. I did this. I, 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 I. It would all, I would be the hero in my own eyes, and I'd get to brag to God about, look what I did. And then God would just step in and sprinkle his miracle, and then we'd get to say, ooh, look, we got anchored this year. But obedience, he would be the one that gets to witness my heart posture, my attitude, and my actual obedience. And the scripture that he gave me along with that was Matthew 6, 33, where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And God just said to me that we often read that scripture and we're so focused on all these things, you know, it's almost like a little hack. We see God, we do this because we can get all these things, right? And God just said to me, what if seeking him and his righteousness was the reward in the first place? And so the question the Holy Spirit prompted me to ask as the year started unfolding was, in any situation, big or small, was, what does obedience look like in this case? What does seeking you and your righteousness in this situation actually look like? And so as the days of the year unfolded, I felt more and more scared, but that's because my mindset was more about, well, what can I do to make sure that I stay obedient? 
But what that was motivated actually by was, well, what hacks can I put in place to make sure that I stay safe, right? Versus Holy Spirit, I submit to your leading. I don't know how this year will unfold, but may my heart posture always be to seek you and your ways. So now I love how when you ask God, you know, these hard questions, he's like, challenge accepted, you know? I once heard a quote that said, um, you know, when you ask God for strength, he doesn't necessarily like, there we go, strength. He gives you the opportunity to grow in that strength. And so here I was leaning into this obedience in everything. And one thing I realized about myself a couple of years ago was that I can be slightly, um, what's the right way of, controlling. You know, I'm a little control freak. I like to put things together and they're like, okay, God, I'm ready for you to do your magic. You know, I, I do it all and then I come to God, right? And one such example was last year. Now, if you don't know, a few years ago, I quit my job and I went to go work on a cruise ship and I got to travel a bit. And I love travel. I, if you don't know me, I love travel, okay? So I got to work on a cruise ship and um, I was in the Caribbean for a bit, then I was in the Mediterranean. Um, and so lot, then COVID happens. I came back, COVID happened, and I couldn't go back, and I was stuck, and I prayed for four years, and eventually nothing. So then last year, the company that I worked for contacted me, and they said they want me back. I was over the moon because this was it. This was the moment that I've been praying for for four years, and God had finally answered my question or my prayers. And then God said to me, turn it down. I said, but wait, God, <laughs> you don't understand. Like, I'll work three hours a day on the ship. I'll get to see the world. I'll get to perform. I'll get to meet new people. Like, this, like, falls in line with everything that I want to do. And God immediately said to me, the ship is not the only way that you'll be able to perform and see the world. And then I rebuttaled. I said, but God, you don't understand. I'll do better with my time. I'll do better with my money. And I was building up my case, right? But... It's one thing to argue with a friend and a colleague and a spouse, but it's another thing when you're trying to argue with God because he's always right, right? So you can either just fall in line with a plan or you'll get it wrong, but he's a gracious God. And whether you make the right decision or not, he'll ultimately always bring you back and he will make a way. It might take long, like very, very long, because I've been there before, right? So at some point I had to decide. I had to turn it down because that's what God had asked me to do. And he led me to... Psalm 27, particularly verse 13 and 14, and it says, I believe I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait on the Lord. Now, some translation says, hope in the Lord. Let your heart take courage, hope in the Lord. So God just impressed on my heart and just said, Dikelo, you will get to see my goodness in the land of the living. In your daily life, you will get to witness it. So just hope in me. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Just hope in me. And so I had to turn it down. It pained me. I cried about it for days and weeks because um, I thought I made a mistake because it made sense in my head, but I had to let it go. Um, and so when the year started and my word was obedience, I went into it like a sulking child, you know, because I was like, well, the plan was there, God. Why did you let me just pass it up? But moping and all, I still had to maintain my reverence for God. And I had to trust him and know that he, he, he makes it all work out and he knows better. And so what I want to share with you tonight, I want to share with you a glimpse of what God has been revealing to me about walking in obedience as the year has been unfolding. Five things that have helped me contextualize what, it, contextualize what it looks like to seek him and, he's, and be obedient even when you think you're right. So point number one, what I learned so far is that obedience is not only applicable in hardship, but also in the blessing. You see, I often related obedience with this thing, this mountain that you must climb up, you know, like a set of rules that are put in place so that you can make sure that you stay safe and the kind of rules that will help enforce learning the lesson the hard way, you know, like turning down the opportunity of a lifetime and nursing a sore heart, but it's okay, I was obedient. And that was my relationship with obedience. But that's not what God showed me. You see, 17 days into the year, um, after turning down the opportunity of a lifetime, I found out that a one-woman show that I had done last year got accepted into the biggest solo theater festival in the world in New York, off-Broadway. Um, 
And my instinctive reaction was, never gonna happen. I don't have the money. Who's gonna pay for the accommodation? Who's gonna pay for the flight? It's now January, the show is in March. Between now and March, everything's gonna happen. I don't have the leave, I don't have the... I went into every single reason why it's just not gonna happen. I didn't even stop to thank God for the opportunity. I responded in fear because I responded in fear because I knew that I wouldn't be able to control anything. But God convicted me of it and I had to repent. I had to repent for upholding my fear more than his sovereignty. And so I began changing my prayer life and started just being intentionally grateful. And God literally asked me to release it to him. And in the same way, I have to seek him in the tough decision and in the tough things of life. I have to seek him in the blessing and ask him how to steward it well. So the second thing that I'm learning so far is that he will not bring it without making a way for it. Now, when I started releasing this trip to God, um, things started slowly coming together, but then slowly falling apart, and then coming together, and then falling apart, because, you know, such is life. So eventually my flights and accommodation ended up being covered by my director, which was great. Big amount that I didn't need to worry about. But then I had to cover my own visa. The only appointment I could get was in Durban. So I had to drive to Durban, get accommodation in Durban, go for my visa appointment. And then when I came back from Durban, my tenant had a plumbing situation, but it was a massive one. It's not a little one. And I was just bleeding money in a space of like two, three weeks. And at some point, I just remember thinking to myself, what is going on? Because God promised me that I'll get to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But why am I going, going through this right now? And I remember at one point, I just burst out to God and I said, what is going on? You said you would cover this. This is on your account. And this is not what I signed up for. I was a little sassy and I had to kind of, okay, sorry, God. Sorry, God. And then God just said to me, okay, well, put, put a budget together. What do you need for New York? So I started putting down a little calculation. I was like, well, to enjoy, I mean, I've never, I had never been to New York before. So I was like, I might need like $100 a day. You know, it's, it's enough to go out, but not too much, not too little. I see you shaking your head. It was enough at the time, okay? It was enough at the time. And like, I just need $100 a day because then I can see the things and, you know, and live okay, right? It was 10 days. And when I did the calculation, $100 a day with the exchange rate at the time was a little over 20,000 rand. I laughed. Because even on my best days, I do not have 20,000 rand lying around, okay? But then, I kept thanking God for the provision that I didn't know where it was going to come from because he promised me that I'll get to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So I released it to him. Now, I don't know if you guys were here early in the year when Rory Dyer was giving his preach. Rory so graciously, I don't know how, but clearly Jesus knew, generously gave me the exact amount that I had put down. I, I'm still so like, when I think about it to this day, and I remember sitting in the front when he gave me the two credit cards, I'm like, what is going on? If I move an inch to the left, it's going to be a dream. And, and Rory just said to me, go and enjoy yourself. And he didn't know what, I was, what he was talking about. He said, just go and enjoy yourself. And I was like, okay. And in that moment, God was like, I told you, you will get to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And in that moment, I, my back was like, okay, God. I'm taking you seriously. Not that I didn't before, but in that moment was what I needed. Now, the trip went on to be a success. Um, came with its own drama. We had a failed engine, stranded in Barcelona, lost luggage for six days. Um, my pianist didn't get a visa, but I met my new pianist the day before my show. Uh, we still walked away with an award, because God was good. Um, but that entire trip was a resounding anthem of, I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So whenever we sing that song that we sang last week, um, I will remain confident in this. For me, it's like, it's a testimony. It's not just the words, it's a testimony in my life. So the third thing that I'm learning so far is that just because it doesn't look like it's supposed to, doesn't mean he's not in it. Now, after I had this trip, this amazing adventure, my faith has revived, everything's amazing. God says to me, Dikelo, I'm gonna read it because this is literally God just speaks to me verbatim. He says to me, New York was a by the way. It was a glimpse and a snapshot into the things that I can do. And I, I will supersede your expectation. So don't ever doubt that. Now I want you to buckle down. There's some things that I need you to do in the next season that will need you to lay low for a bit. 
And I was like, okay, lay low. Now, I've been doing worship ministry for about 19 years now. It's something that I'm really privileged that I get to do. Um, and so God says to me, he asked me to start writing content to train other worship leaders. And I remember feeling a little anticlimactic, you know, like, I've just come from this massive high. I've traveled. I can tell people of the goodness of the Lord. Look what he did. It was this, and it was less than two months. You know, I could do that. And now he wants me to spend the next season writing. So I asked him. I said, well, for how long do you want me to write for? You know, is it a page? Is it a devotional? Is it a book? Because it can't be a book. I don't write books. Um, and one thing that I've realized is that it's so easy to fall in step with the exciting stuff, the stuff that have a quicker turnaround time, the stuff that have a tangible um, things that you can be like, oh yes, that's definitely God. Oh yes, this is gonna work out, right? Um, but we have to be careful to make sure to take it as seriously as the exciting stuff because God himself has asked you to do something. I remember hearing a quote a little while ago that said, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Because you've basically decided, Oh, when I'm ready, I'll let you know. And I quickly realized that that's what, exactly what I was doing. But then I also realized that the fear in me was actually fear that was basically saying, you, Gelo, a writer, writing to teach other people. Um, how are you even going to do it? Like all the doubts in my mind started flooding through. And then I had to remember Psalm 27 verse 14, hope in the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, the Holy Spirit was like, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. So the fourth thing that I'm learning so far in my year of obedience is that he can't bless or work in what you don't surrender. He cannot bless or work in whatever you don't surrender. Now, one thing that I learned quickly when the New York opportunity came around and life all around me was just lifing hard was the practice of having honest prayers. Learning how to have an honest prayer life helped me to sort of let go of control and let go of the outcome of that prayer. I realized that if I'm, if I'm praying, hear my cries, O oh Lord, but I don't actually pray about the things that is aching my heart, you know, or I say things like, I'm blessed and highly favored, but I'm in deep hurt. Or I say things like, well, if God is for me, who can be against me? but you're in battling intense conflict with family, colleagues, or whoever. And not that saying these scripture out loud is anything wrong with that, but you're still not bringing the core issue to Jesus, you know? And you're not doing him a favor by pretending like nothing is wrong. And I had to learn that the hard way. Because it's actually an insult to him. You're basically saying, I don't think you can handle this one, so hang ten, I'll come back once it's better, you know? Um, and so when, ha when, I, when we have on this conversation, he's able to speak to us and help us see perspective. Now, I had an issue with a team that I was working with a little while ago. Um, it was an issue that was weighing me down. You know those moments where you're like, I know I'm right, and you just need to listen to me, because if you listen to me, everything would work. That was me. I, it, it really like tore me apart, and I had, to have, I had to bring it to Jesus, and I had a, a hard conversation with Jesus about it. Um, I vented. I told him why, what my side was. I told him my perspective of it um, and the issue that he ne needs to be addressed. And I was just raw and open and honest with God. But God, in being a gracious and loving and kind God, he gently just says to me, Dikelo, you are right. I did put that conviction in you. But right now, you are more concerned with being right. So if you confront the people with this, you will say the right thing with the wrong heart and the wrong motive, and they will miss it completely. The Word of God says that He makes everything beautiful in its time. Even hard conversations, He creates the right time and space for it to happen, where the heart can receive it without being defensive or accusational. Again, I had to remember, hope in the Lord. Let your heart take courage. He will fight for me. The last thing I'm learning so far, not the last thing, so far in this year, the first thing that I'm learning is don't consult your feelings, consult the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you guys, but I can make up a story that supports what I feel easily. Can't do my devotional in the morning. It's too cold. It's dark outside. By the time I sit with my Bible in front of me, I'm falling asleep again. 
Can't do it in the evening. The day has gone past and then I'm just tired and then I'm not really focusing. I'm thinking about the thing the next day. Can't do it then. Can't really go and apologize to that person because it's been seven months already and they've probably forgot, forgotten. So it's going to be awkward if I bring it up, you know. So I'm just going to leave it. Can't do this content because I'm not really a writer and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to park it and maybe if someone else asks me, I might give them advice. Can't speak about Jesus to that colleague because what if they curse Jesus? But let's be honest. We're just making excuses here. You see, the Holy Spirit is our helper, and we need to invite him in those spaces and let him do exactly that, help. What I realized in those moments is that my feelings become a lot more intense when I crave the outcome more than I crave the intimacy of being with Jesus in the process. I'm going to say that again. My feelings become a lot more intense when I crave the outcome more than I crave the intimacy of being with Jesus in the process. See, in the process of writing this content that God's asked me to do, I find myself making excuses. I'm not feeling inspired. Not really sure what to say. I don't really know how to structure it. But whenever I decide to just let go of this and overcome these emotions, um, and I sit in front of my laptop, the Holy Spirit just pours words out of me. Words that were never there two minutes ago when I was having an argument with my mind. But he just pours it out. And in those moments, I'm reminded that he is my reward. I literally get to sit with God while he speaks truth, while he speaks and entrusts me with these words that would hopefully one day get to encourage other people. Like the visualization of I get to sit with God and he's speaking and I'm sp like we're doing this together, right? Before the outcome of the instruction even happens, I get to be in his presence. And that's a lot more valuable than anything. So in closing, I would like to propose that whatever is for you, whatever in your life, um, whatever the next step is, the goal is, the thing that you're trying to achieve, um, be it ministry, family, work, that you would invite God into those spaces, but you would have honest praise. Allow the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do, which is help. For me, the questions that I had to ask myself in those spaces was, God, what does obedience look like? For you, it might be, what does forgiveness look like? What does hope look like? What's just joy, for, um, patience, perseverance? What is the, or you might need to actually even ask him what your word is. What is that thing that you're craving to honor in this year? But whatever he reveals, let your reward be dwelling with him as he reveals it more than the outcome. Let him be your reward. Thanks.